Welcome back. Today we are going to talk about digital music. In this seminar, I'm going to talk about the digital music revolution and how Apple fundamentally changed how we purchase and listen to music. I'll share with you how to purchase and download music onto your devices. And I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about internet radio and music streaming services. Last, I'll share with you different accessories that are available out there for your listening pleasure. Not too long ago, we used to listen to music on albums, 45s, 8-track tapes, cassettes. We listened on turntables, boom boxes, Sony Walkmans, CD players. And the CD really brought in the first stage of digital music. Then CDs were replaced by the MP3 file. An MP3 file is a music or audio file. And the invention of the MP3 file quickly turned to music piracy and companies like Napster. On June 1st, 1999, a piece of computer software was released that changed the way we listen to music forever. Sean Fanning, a 19-year-old U.S. computer hacker, worked out a way to share music over the internet for free. It was essentially a cataloging system that searched your computer hard drive and would list all the MP3 music files contained in it. Because of what Napster developed, it allowed people to share music with one another. As long as you had the Napster software on your computer, you could collect and share music with anyone else who had that software anywhere in the world. College students are making good use of the internet. The latest software makes it a bit too easy for students to access their favorite tunes. The main challenge was can this thing scale to a massive number of users? And I just thought, okay, if this piece of code works, this is going to be huge. And I had a moment there where I asked myself, is it morally correct? Technology is advancing. This is going to happen anyway. You have a generation of people now who expect their music for free. I don't care how wrong it is, I've got good intentions. It's very difficult to change. In 1998, at Northeastern University, a freshman, Sean Fanning, began developing a computer program called Napster in his dorm room. He asked for help from Ali Idar, a veteran programmer he knew through his uncle. And my response to him was, you need to just concentrate on your studies. Fanning didn't follow Ali's advice. He dropped out to focus on the program and partnered with fellow teenage programmer Sean Parker to release a beta version. As it started to spread through chat rooms, they traveled to the Bay Area to grow the business. Initially, I was skeptical that, gosh, I'm sitting across from two 18 or 19 year olds. I changed my tune once I learned that there are already 40,000 people using this thing. It was one of the first large-scale peer-to-peer file-sharing programs. It allowed users to access music files stored on the hard drives of fellow Napster users. 40,000 wasn't a big number, but it was bigger than what I thought it was gonna be initially, which was zero because people weren't willing to open up their hard drives. What I realized was that people's emotional ties to music, their general interest in music, was more than enough to overwhelm any kind of security or privacy concern. The CD boom was from 84 to 2000. You actually had to drive your car to the Tower Records and buy a CD for $18 to get the one song you liked. And so that was a good model. It made the industry tons and tons of cash. It was on college campuses with high-speed internet 
that Napster really took off in the fall of 99. So uh, how many MP3s do you have on your computer? About 600. Maybe like 100 or something? Uh, six or 7,000. Napster. 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 It's called file sharing, seen by some as the wave of the future. It was very exciting. We knew we were building something that was going to be big. Ladies and gentlemen, creative Napster, Sean Fanning. When I first heard about Napster, I recall my impression having two different elements. One being, this is incredible, it's revolutionary, and things will never be the same again in the music industry. And the other being, this is going to destroy the recording industry. No longer do you have to go to a store and plunk down money. And so, months after Napster's rise, the recording industry began a long legal battle to stop it. They're waging a war in the courts over who controls what artists create. We've heard that we couldn't survive before when we had 700,000 members and when we had 17 million members. We felt pretty strongly that digital distribution was going to bring the industry closer to its customer. And instead of killing it, they would take advantage of the value that it brought. But to record companies whose artists range from Tony Bennett to Metallica, this new technology in the wrong hands is simply stealing. A business model built on infringement is not only morally wrong, but legally wrong. At the time, the Recording Industry Association of America was reporting about $15 billion a year of revenue in the U.S. alone. Anybody with enough money could go and make a record. But that didn't guarantee you getting into stores, which was the only place that you could actually buy that record. That was the power of the music business, the distribution. The issue made its way to Capitol Hill. Napster hijacked our music without asking. A chorus of studies show that Napster... The free music service run by Napster was ordered to stop the music. In July of 2001, after more than a year of legal battles, the internet startup, which at its peak had about 70 million registered users, shut down its entire network in response to court orders. We accurately estimated that the courts would say, you just don't have the right to give away all this stuff. And so we were perhaps a little smug and confident in the belief that the well, courts would say it's not that and people would stop doing it. We didn't really factor in the consumer adoption, the youthful lack of respect for a copyright, and the anonymity com would combine to make it pretty unstoppable as a model. The industry may have crushed Napster, but the idea had taken hold, and a flurry of other downloading services took its place. It's free and it's easy and, you know, it's wrong, yeah, but a lot of people do it. Pretty much everybody does. But CD sales continued to plummet, shuttering record stores across the country. An industry in turmoil. So when Steve Jobs came to the table with plans for a new online music store, the major labels finally surrendered the thing they had fought so hard to maintain, the distribution. You had only two choices. Either you don't do a deal with Steve, in which case people continue to just email the MP3s to their friends, or you do a business with him and he has a store and then you can sell things. This week, Apple Computer launched its iTunes Music Store. And they are hoping that this is an answer to some of the piracy that is going on online. Over the next several years, digital sales boomed. More than three billion songs. But today, even the iTunes model is threatened by the shifting sands of music distribution. Download sales are declining as online streaming services like Spotify gain popularity. Many, many records are made by people in their garages, basements, or bedrooms, and the distribution is there. They'll make a video, they'll stick it on YouTube, and if it's good, people will find it. Macklemore and Ryan Lewis jump-started their career without a record label when their video went viral on YouTube. You have artists like Macklemore, who was able to reach millions and millions of fans before getting to radio. He would have had a very difficult time achieving that if you were to rewind back to the 90s. Music is as important, if not more important, than it's ever been. I think the challenge is of finding ways to monetize that importance. Napster might have hurt recorded music sales, but 
It's the responsibility of the industry to figure out how to extract their value out of each generation. This happens in every industry. The Rocky Mountain News published its final edition. Blockbuster Video is no more. Borders is going into liquidation. Music was the first industry that really had to confront the idea of free content. Music was at the forefront of it, whether it liked it or not. What soon followed up was Apple and the invention of the iPod. In 2001, Steve Jobs, the CEO of Apple, introduced an MP3 player called the iPod. The iPod revolutionized how we listen to, manage, and store our music. Fast forward to today, and we still have the iPod Touch, and it's still an MP3 player, but it does so much more. Like the iPhone, the iPod is a music player, it has built-in cameras, it's basically a computer in your hand. So you can do all these things, plus it has built-in GPS, calendar, music store, weather, photo album, movie theater, voice recorder, remote control, news, travel agent, calculator, bird guide, medication reminder, on and on and on. All of this we have in the palm of our hand. And why is that? Because of apps. I've talked about apps before, but let's dive a little bit deeper. What is an app? The most popular definition of an app is software. In fact, app is short for software application. And apps typically run on smartphones like an iPhone or an Android device, or maybe you have a tablet like an iPad. And apps you purchase through the App Store, if you're on an Apple device, or if you're on an Android, you would purchase apps and download them through the Google Play app. The chances are you've been using apps for years. Your home or work computer has apps like a spreadsheet program, calculator, or photo editor. Recently, these apps or applications evolved in a big way. Let's start with platforms. You know, a place to put things. A table, in a basic sense, is a platform. You plug in some plates, cups, and flatware, and it turns into a great place to eat. Computers work the same way. They create platforms for software applications. A spreadsheet and an accounting app can turn a computer into a business tool. Music and video apps can make a computer a studio. For most of their history, apps have seemed big and expensive. We often bought them at a store and loaded them onto a computer with a disk. And most of these apps didn't connect to the internet. Recently, platforms changed in big ways. Our mobile phones and tablets became useful platforms just like our computers, and this enabled a different kind of app. Instead of big, expensive programs, many apps became smaller and cheaper. Instead of coming in a box or taking hours to download, they could be purchased or downloaded for free from the internet with a click, even on the go. This made apps collectible. For little investment, we could collect apps on our devices that reflect our needs and interests. One person's collection may focus on gaming, another business, or both. Now, apps may wake you up in the morning, give you a snapshot of the news, play the music you like, help you get to the airport, check you in, 
and help you read your new book all from the palm of your hand. To support all these new apps, we need online marketplaces that make them easy to purchase and download. This way, small teams and large organizations have a way to market, give away, or sell thousands of new apps. And these new apps have another advantage. Many are built to work with the internet. This means they can back up your work, play your music, or connect you with friends wherever you are without opening a web browser. But it's not just phones and tablets. Computers, browsers, social networks, and gaming systems have all become platforms for a new generation of apps. So apps aren't really new. What have changed are platforms and marketplaces that make them easy to purchase and collect for whatever you need to do. In conjunction with the invention of the Apple iPod, Apple also introduced iTunes. iTunes was a media player, media library, online store, and mobile device management app developed by Apple. It was used to play, download, and organize digital and audio and video files on personal computers. It was a way to basically manage your music library on your computer. So think of iTunes as kind of a record store that you would get in your car or walk down the street and go to your local record store. You would sift through the albums, you'd pick out a handful, you'd walk up to the register, and you'd purchase your albums. The concept is the same, except instead of a physical music store, this was all done on your computer. With the iTunes software on your computer, you could search for and purchase music and then store that on your device. And then that music could then be shared on multiple devices. So iTunes, in essence, is a record store but it's a virtual record store, which then allows me, once I purchase that music, to be able to play and listen to that music on any other device I have that uses the iTunes software. So in this example, I'm interested in the Beatles' Abbey Road album. I get on my iPhone or my iPod, and I do a search for Abbey Road, and I purchase and download that music using my iTunes app. My iCloud account stores that album for me, and then it pushes down those MP3 files to my various devices and allows me to play the Beatles' Abbey Road at any time on any device that I have. It is true. Well, kind of. After 18 years, Apple finally decided to end the groundbreaking iTunes platform in June of 2019. It would be replaced with Apple Music and the iTunes Store, two separate apps. Apple Music is what's referred to as a subscription-based music streaming service and it has over 60 million songs available for you to listen to. Features include the ability to download your favorite music and play them offline so you don't have to be connected to the internet. It also has a feature where you can read the lyrics in real time and you can listen across all your favorite devices. The other app, the iTunes Store app, is really a one-stop media shop on your iPhone your iPod Touch, or your iPad. With the iTunes Store app, you can find and purchase music, movies, TV shows, audiobooks, organize and play your music and videos, as well as play and download unlimited songs with the Apple Music app, which is, a again, a paid subscription. No. Every song you've ever purchased previously 
through iTunes will be part of your Apple Music collection. All the files that you have already have on your computer, your iPhone, your iPad will remain. Apple isn't going to be liquidating anything you already own, but it will reorganize where those files live. And we'll finish up this part of the seminar with a demo on Apple Music and the iTunes Store apps.